Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Advent in Narnia. In person, very exciting. Show of hands, how many of you came in through the wardrobe this morning? I mean, you can't see because there's not a camera on them, but we have a room full of, what would you say, 60 or so people who have just walked through a wardrobe. How fun, that's wonderful. I want to take a moment to introduce you all to our guest who is joining us virtually. One of the benefits of the pandemic is that we learned how to do this with friends far away. Mother Heidi Haverkamp is a writer, a spiritual director, an Episcopal priest, and author of Advent in Narnia, a collection of daily meditations for Advent. I hope that you were able to join us last week for our Advent Family Festival, many of the activities and the snacks that you saw in this room were suggested in the book. And our decorations today, some of which are a little obscured by our screen, including the wardrobe at the entrance, were inspired by the work. Mother Heidi is the author of two official books, including a newly published year-long personal study and prayer resource based on the Sunday lectionary. And this first book that's been released is for this year, Year C. It's called Everyday Connections, Reflections and Practices for Year C. She's also written a book for Lent that is intriguing to me, Holy Solitude, Lenten Reflections with Saints, Hermits, Prophets, and Rebels. <laughs> it also seems neat that I mention on this second Sunday of Advent when we remember John the Baptizer's call to prepare the way of the Lord through repentance, that Mother Heidi has written an award-winning article that she titled, how I learned to love the doctrine of total depravity. <laughs> <laughs> the article is everything as intriguing as the title. I commend it to you. You can find that on her page, HeidiHaverCamp.net. Mother Heidi received her MDiv from the University of Chicago Divinity School in 2006 and later earned a certificate of Anglican Studies from Seabury Western. She lives in Indianapolis with her husband, it has been a great joy to get to know you, Mother Heidi, as we have worked together, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce all of you to my new friend. After Mother Heidi kickstarts our series with a little bit of a background on how she came to write this book, Advent in Narnia, our panel, including for today, Mother Heidi, will jump in and discuss the first five chapters of the book. Joining Father Casey and I to the panel as we do this moment of introduction are our own doctors, Roy Heller and Robert Patton, who, if you joined us last year for Advent with Ebenezer, were very familiar. <laughs> Here they are in the flesh. So with, with no further ado, Mother Heidi, I'll turn it over to you and say a wonderful and warm welcome from your friends here at Transfiguration. Thank you so much. Um... I'll just note um, right now, um, I can't see any of you. Um, this uh, screen's gone blank, um, but I'm just gonna keep talking and sort of go on faith here, right? So uh, I can hear you. So um, so thank you so much for this welcome. And I'm just thrilled that that you all are using my book, Advent and Narnia, which, um, which I wrote because it was a topic I just love. I, I first read The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe when I was a little kid. And I remember then just being so taken in by just the beautiful images that C.S. Lewis captures in the novel and the story and the characters just kind of really catch you. They're, they're so simple, but they're so familiar and you just care about them and want to know what's going to happen to them. Um, then when I was in seminary, um, the parish where I was serving uh, did a vacation Bible school based on Narnia. And so that kind of brought Narnia back to my attention as an adult. Um, and I remember we decked out the church, probably very much like your church is decked out with a wardrobe and a lamppost. And we led the children all around the building for the different activities. And, um, and we watched the, some of the movies that have been made about the novel as well. And that, also, that just reminded me what an amazing story it is. And then when I was in my own parish, um, I just sort of remembered, and this was always sort of in the back of my head, that Narnia was this rich resource. And, you know, the, again, those images, they're so powerfully 
um, adventy, I guess, for lack of a better word, especially in that first half of the book, you know, the snow, the forest of evergreen trees, the light and the darkness, um, all these creatures waiting for Aslan to come. Um, and because the Vacation Bible School resource existed, I was just sure that somebody had an Advent curriculum out there that also used Narnia. But uh, as much as I searched and tried to look for something, uh, it wasn't there. So I, um, one of the years, oh, there, I can see you again. That's nice. Um, but <laughs> uh, so, um, into a wardrobe. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I don't think you can see me anymore, but um, I guess we just have to trade back and forth. Um, so it goes. Um, so I just wrote my own one year. And um, as I sat down with my parish and we talked about the book and we talked about um, Aslan and the White Witch and repentance and waiting, and we just had such a great time. Um, well, there we go. Um, yay. Um, <laughs> so, um, and when I looked down and looked at this curriculum that I'd put together, I sort of realized, you know what, this could be a book. Um, and I was growing in my writing, I was meeting friends and publishing, um, and it took about six months, but I found a publisher that also thought it could be a book. And, um, so we got it out into the world and I've just been thrilled that so many other churches and people also want to walk into Narnia for Advent and meet and meet Jesus there, meet God there. Um, I just think it so powerfully captures the wonder that Advent is supposed to be. You know, Advent can be such a crazy, crazy time. It can be also a time of deep struggle and grief, you know, a time when some of our, our painful memories or the people we've lost are very present to us um, and just the pressure of the season. And I think Lewis and, and God invite us to something different, something deeper. Um, and what I like about Narnia too is, you know, Lucy doesn't have to work to find Narnia. She just falls in. She doesn't mean to go there. Um, she's wandering around and she opens the door and there it is. And then later when she tries to find it, she tries to bring her siblings with her and they can't, they can't get in. Um, it's only when they fall in by grace, right? So maybe that's also God's invitation to us that Advent and maybe even faith, um, our relationship with God is something we fall into. Um, that doesn't mean we have to work so very hard um, or we're not doing it right. Um, so, so that's the story of the book. And I'm just, I love seeing all the decorations that I can see in the, through the camera. And I, I love the, um, the white reindeer next to Rebecca. I think that's my favorite. Um, <laughs> So, yeah. So what, um, and I love to hear what other people notice when they, when they read either The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe or my book. So I, I can't wait to hear what some of these awesome folks um, sitting on the panel also have to say. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. We'll just jump right in. Uh, we have asked those who are here today to read their way through chapters one through five, so we'll try to focus our comments and our reflections on what we, what we noticed in those initial chapters, and I'll just kick us off by saying that I too had noticed how Lucy just falls into Narnia, and isn't it fantastic that that happens, at least as far as I could tell, when it's raining outside, when there's nothing else to do, when um, all the distractions of the world that might take one away from an encounter with God have been cleared away, then it opens up this, this um, doorway into a new world. I, I just wondered, Lewis had four characters there, and he picked the youngest, and girl to be the one who receives the first visit. And I was just wondering what people made out of that choice because he had four characters. What does it mean that the, the youngest and least experienced uh, is the one who gets to learn first? She's the most she's the most innocent just in her complete mm. character uh, because she um, she's the least cynical she meets, she enters into this wonderful magical land and immediately encounters a magical creature and is not 
overwhelmed by it, thrown by it, frightened by it. She, he immediately becomes her friend. And she just seems the least, I mean, like when, when we hear Jesus talk about um, uh, that you must enter into the kingdom like a child, I think he gives us Lucy, Lewis gives us Lucy as a representation of, of everything that that entails. Um, it's not only her age, it is her whole way of encountering the world. Mm -hmm. Lucy's a value. Indeed. That's right. Yeah. It's, um, I think Mother Rebecca mentioned this in her piece last week. It's, it's that prayer we pray for the baptized. Somebody said this. Um, the newly baptized, we pray that you would have joy and wonder in all of God's works. We pray that prayer over people in the baptized. And that is Lucy. Mm -hmm. She enters into this land and is immediately like overwhelmed by joy and wonder. Whereas Edmund enters in and it, it is almost painful to him. The whole experience is almost painful to him because he is angry. He is not, seems to be more naturally inclined toward jealousy. Um, he is uh, petty. Spiteful over he is and over and spiteful. over. Spiteful. Yeah. So he is, um, <laughs> you know, he is sort of the, the sort of, if Lucy is the archetype of childhood, Edmund is like the jaded adult. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, maybe yeah i would say i've met plenty of adults like that as well <laughs> but isn't there um, a little bit of edmund in all of us i mean i also absolutely. want us to be careful not to like make edmund the bad one right and that they're bad people and good people and i mean i, I wonder if there's a little bit of all those children in each of us yeah I, I totally think Lewis is doing that. He's, he's giving us four characters who offer us different dimensions of humanity. I, I absolutely think so. I mean, even Mike, again, the, 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 um, the scene that I come over and over and over back to, not just in the first five chapters, but throughout, throughout the whole book is when she visits, visits with Mr. Tumnus the first time, right? And it's like, she starts crying um, how awful, um, so he, he, he claims that she, he's in the pay of the white witch. What does she pay him for? I'm a kidnapper for her. That's what I am. Look at me, daughter of Eve. Would you believe that I'm the sort of fawn who would meet a poor, innocent child in the wood, one that had never done me any harm and pretend to be friendly with it, interestingly enough, yes, it, yes. and invite it <laughs> home to my cave, all for the sake of lulling it asleep and then handing it over the white witch. No, I'm sure you wouldn't do anything of this sort, <laughs> but I have. Again, she's in his, she, even, not, not just generally, but even in her relationships with other people. Yeah. So, yeah. And there's that wonderful interrogation in the, the old man's library about, uh, you know, the, the, because Lucy is being accused of lying. And, you know, can you believe that she would lie? And just two old kids have to say, no, yeah. she's not a liar. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that's, uh, as I understand it, the kind of the, the basic interrogation of C.S. Lewis's belief. If you see these testimonies and you believe that the person who testified is neither mad nor lying, then it must be true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. You know, I, I think too, I'm not sure a grown up would ever walk through a wardrobe um, and, and keep walking in. And then when they saw there was snow and a wood and a light, um, would they really? <laughs> Would they really walk all the way in? And um, yeah, I just think, I mean, you, you guys have sort of mentioned the word trust and, um, you know, willingness to be vulnerable. You know, I always love in the story, she keeps looking back too to make sure the door is still open. She hasn't locked herself in, um, um, but she's, she's open to that wonder and that sense that, and that maybe there's an alternative reality. Um, imagination builds out 
the whole realm and the whole story. Mr. Tundas. Tundas. Tundas is first. But the wardrobe he also encountered and just thought it would be an interesting plot um, tool to sort of yeah, be a doorway. But I love the wardrobe because we talked about a couple of times in the story about how uh, how musty it is filled with mothballs. Mm -hmm. And it's this old, dusty, uh, musty, uh, old thing where old things are kept and put away and out of sight and forgotten. Mm -hmm. and, and I just, I'm like, this is the church. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't help but with a picture of Lewis. Lewis, who probably spent all of his life going into old English churches that were musty and dusty and old and increasingly, even at that point, increasingly forgotten. And that is, whether he was aware of it or not, I was just so struck by how he, he found this place that imaginatively evokes all of the sensations of walking into an old church. And that is the doorway through which we enter into the magical land. And I bet that's subconscious, but it's for me, it's there. It's interesting when he describes that wardrobe and the room that it sits in, he says, and shortly after that, they looked into a room that was quite empty, except for one big wardrobe, the sort that has a looking glass in the door. Isn't that interesting? Maybe. There's something you're going to see about yourself through this wardrobe. And then he goes on to say, there's nothing else in the room at all except a dead blue bottle on the window. So <laughs> I have to look that up. Does everyone know what a blue bottle is? It's a kind of fly, right? And it's dead on the window. So like no one's been in there in a very long time, right? Yeah. But they don't make any more, either the illustrator or Lewis makes any more of that mirror. Oh. Oh. Just, kind of that, just exactly what you're saying. Very interesting moment because you see yourself in the mirror and then you open the door and you're into another world. And do you have to then lose yourself in this other world, a different kind of reflection of you? I don't know what Lewis might have intended you to do, but um, it's 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 a clue. <laughs> and it only and it's only open sometimes because Lucy comes back once yeah. and only finds coats. <laughs> I was really struck. I never noticed that before until reading it this time again. That she actually has an intermittent visit to the wardrobe that is what unsuccessful, I guess you might say. Again, I find that if this whole thing is is a is a rich metaphor for the life of faith and entering into an immersive engagement with God, then I find something really honest about the fact that she shows up once and it doesn't work. Because she because she intends to, she does she intends to go to God. And she's no less innocent or earnest or eager. She's the same person, and yet for some reason that day, nope, it's not there. That's never, never happened to me in my school. Ever. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't that happen with all of us in our experience with younger people? I, exactly. Except for right. Except for yeah. him. No, no. <laughs> exactly. And I, but I find that to be such a inclusion in the story that you don't get to snap your fingers and enter into the wonderland it is um it is an act of grace like mother heidi was talking about there is something gracious about this that is not human uh you don't manipulate it and, and i want to say i i don't think that means that god plays games with people right or that god is um I don't know, trying to mess with us. So, I mean, maybe it's just a mystery because I'm not sure I have an answer for why you can get in and sometimes you can't, just as Lewis, he doesn't really offer us a reason, but I think, um, you know, the world is mysterious. Faith is mysterious. Um, God is beyond us. Um, and, you know, the children still have each other, I suppose, is something I come to um, when they can't go through the door. Um, and Narnia is still there, even when you can't walk. Right. I mean, that's what strikes me is that Narnia is still there, whether she can access it or not, right? I mean, when they're talking to the professor, right, um, Peter asks, right, after the whole Lord Liar lunatic uh, conversation, uh, but do you really mean, sir, said Peter, that there could be other worlds all over the place, just around the corner like that? Well, nothing's more probable, he says, right? It's, it, this is a, actually, the, for the professor, at least, this is unusual. Right? Which just blows my mind. 
Close their eyes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Last year, we spent a lot of time on time and the way that time works in interesting ways in a Christmas Carol for Dickens and the interactions with the three spirits for, the, for, for Scrooge were extensive and lengthy and, and he was in them for a long time and then he would come back and time was all completed and it was like not a moment to pass. And here again, you enter into Narnia, she thinks she's been there for hours. She's had this long tea and been essentially put to sleep and she comes back out and it's a split second later. And that of course is one of the reasons why he says it's believable because there are different times in different worlds. And uh, that certainly, if any of you read the rest of the series, um, follows through in all of them. The time on Earth and the time on Narnia are completely different. So they're completely different. One of the things I was very skeptical about this book, I read Narnia years ago. And, um, and then when uh, Mother Camp pointed out that the first thing they walk into is the snow and the light. Again, saying, "Oh, I better rethink," <laughs> because that is so much a kind of advent um, image, isn't it? Of, of snow, of, of, of not a snow picture, like light and a, and even a bareness, a, 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 a new new beginning. I mean, it is. It turns out something of a new beginning, but yeah, it's it's empty. It's kind of like the new beginning in a sense. Yeah. Except it's got this wonderful poem and never before a human being. This, this is not a poem with human beings. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's quite fascinating that um, the world is full of animals. It's um, who are still God's creatures, right? These talking animals and humans are new and the savior Aslan isn't just for humans at all, but also for, for animals. Except for the witch. She's, yeah, she's another kind of creature. Um, she's not a human. She's not Aslan's creature and she's not a human, right? She, you have to read the other books and I don't want to spoil that, but um, you can hear about the origin of the witch in Advent by reading the magician's uh, nephew. The, the time, if I could just for a second come back to the time thing, because last year we were exploring it so intentionally, and that's what one of the things about Narnia that makes it so perfect for Advent is Advent is a season in which time is layered upon itself, in which we become much more aware of the ways in which time is stacked instead of this long thread, you know, where you're here and then you're here, but you never. Advent reminds us of the ways in which time is, um, is blurred because at, in Advent, we are remembering God's coming long ago and God's anticipatory return one day, the final return, but also it's not just either or, it's also the in-between of God coming into the world all the time. And they are like in Dickens, they are kind of all blurred up into the same night. They're, and so here again in Narnia, we get that nod to time not always working the way we think it does. And, um, God just wasn't long ago or someday, one day far away. It's also now, and it's also back then, like the past is not really the past. Um, and the future is, is kind of built in, baked into now as well. And Narnia plays with that. And, and I'll stick out to my own like, academic study. And stories do that. Yeah. Stories play with time. When we enter into stories of magic, it's almost as if we're stepping into another world. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's a great irony I think, that we that during Advent the last two years we studied fiction. Yeah. Um, I think that's rather yeah. remarkable. Yeah. Rather powerful. Because she can make in, 
you know, food instantly and promises things in the future. And Lucy's dealing with the present very much and in a whole. I mean, it would recognizably be an English whole. I mean, it's got T's of Europe for service. And, uh, I don't know where Ceylon was in the party, but tea was there. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it, between the interior home and Lucy's belief in the fall that changes him or it, uh, and Edmund's skepticism and eventual belief about all the promises of the witch, uh, we, we've got just gorgeous kind of contrast on, on, on almost every level interior and exterior, belief that makes works magic one way and belief that works magic the other way. Uh, so that those those moments are themselves uh, in contrast, but sometimes I didn't think until recently about contrasting them in one time. Speaking speaking of time, so another it seems to me another another commonality between Christmas Carol mm -hmm. last year and language this year is the notion of of knowledge, right? Memory. Knowledge, what we know, what we don't know. Uh, if you remember last year, Scrooge had forgotten all about his childhood. Mm -hmm. But when he's reminded of it, that's where the change starts happening within him because he remembers who he had been, but he had forgotten it. It's, for me, at least, it's interesting is that um, when at the end of Lucy's visit with Mr. Thomas, I actually have read the whole book. <laughs> uh, but uh, when she, um, when he eventually uh, gets down to um, um, uh, 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 hold on just a second. Um, I'm very sorry, Mr. Thomas, <coughs> Lucy, but please let me go home. Right? Yes. Well, of course I will," said the pawn. "Of course I've got to. I see that now. I had known." What humans were like before I met you. But it doesn't know if that is not true in a sense because he does know about humans because he's read lots of books about them, right? Because <laughs> she sees on his bookshelf titles like The Life and Letters of Salinas or Nymphs in Their Ways or Men, Monks, and Gamekeepers, a study of popular legend. <laughs> <laughs> Or is man a myth? <laughs> Which is, of course, right? So we're stepping out of the story, right? You can imagine a book, right? Is God a myth, right? Is man a myth? So he, he, he's actually quite educated about people, human beings. But he's never met them. He has never known what they're like. Right? And so for me, at least, it's, it's, that, it's that notion of, and again, speaking from my own thing, academic way. But then experiential. Sure. He calls her daughter of Eve right away. Say what? Yeah. He calls her daughter, daughter of Eve. That's right. Because he's able to recognize. Yeah. He's got a hand in the far back. And in piggybacking on that, it's like the, the world that has never had humans knows about us. But then when he first meets the very first human he's ever met, he is, even after reading all those books that he has on the shelf, whatever deep down. He instinctively treats her as this precious, precious, I don't know, I don't say thing, but, you know, he knows to, you know, whisk her away and to keep her safe. And, you know, regardless of what happens next, but he, it's not like he's like sounding the alarm, blowing whistles. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, he, he's like, there, I need to keep you safe. You are so precious to us. And I, I always thought that was. Well, she is precious, right? Yeah. And she's particularly precious to the story. Like, isn't it interesting that he meets her first of all, yes. right? Um, one of my professors once told me to pay attention to beginnings. Um, <laughs> I wonder who that could be. Once, once there were four children whose names were Peter, Susan, Edna, and Lucy, their names are really important to C.S. Lewis. They come out of the beginning. What does Lucy mean? It means light. Isn't that interesting? It's also the daughter of this Lucy's the daughter. Lucy's the name. Yes. 
Just, I looked them all up. So just so we have the rundown, Peter, of course, we know, Rock. Susan is Lily or Rose. Edmund, interestingly, he's got a girl into his name. I think he may have forgotten what his name means. Edmund means protector. Wow, right? We get, that, we get that later in this other stories. Yeah. We do get that much later, yes. And then, of course, Lucy is light. And so, and, and the light of Christ is something to be protected, right? And to be carried forward. I mean, it is interesting, right, that it, it seems to me that among those four, right, okay, jumping ahead to the, near the end of the story. See, I have read it. Peter and Susan actually fulfill who they are at the end, right? And Lucy is a, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll complicate her just a little bit because we talked about her as being naive and, and giving and all this, stuff. but she's also very fearful. She's a very fearful, and I can show you a dozen examples throughout the whole thing. She's she's unsure, which of course goes along with the naive head, right? She's also very fearful, but you notice at the end, it's, it's Lucy the Valiant, right? And Edmund the, uh, and just, then, uh, just, huh? just, just, exactly, right? Mm -hmm. And so two of them sort of fulfill who they are, the leader, right, and the uh, the impact, right? And But Lucy and Edmund sort of change their, I think, change their characters and become even more who they are at the beginning. They actually, oh, there's a good idea, <laughs> change. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> change in just a moment because we have these two figures by chapter five. I'm trying to be very careful about what I know from reading the whole series. Um, that all each meets someone in Narnia and they have an instinctive response to whether the person is true or not. So Lucy believes in the fawn and that's not true at the beginning. And Edmund believes that the witch and that's although doesn't he have a he doesn't he have a sense that the witch isn't quite right and he decides to go with her anyway, I want to say. Mm. Well, he, yeah, but you know, he really believes that, you know, he, he's gonna be the one who's the prince who becomes the king, and when she said, Well, bring your brother back, you know, no, no, we don't, you don't pay any attention to him, just me. So there's a willingness to accept that promotion into being the top dog instead of the second dog uh, in the litter. Um, and I, so he raises the issue for me every time I read it. Is it always wrong to say, hey, wait a minute, do we really have the information we need in order to make a decision? Because both of those children are wrong about the person they're with. Mm. But Lucy's belief alters Thomas. And uh, <laughs> Edmund's belief only encourages the witch. <laughs> well, I was just going to say, uh, to your point, doesn't that just show that dichotomy, the possibility in each of us? Every person that you meet, you can either see someone who can, you know, what help you in your own selfish endeavors, you can take advantage of them, you can advance your own interests, or you can look at someone as Lucy does. And see the potential of that person to make the right choice to become the better human being. So she sees that potential in one of us. And then sees the uh, you know the, the evil in between them. Yeah, Evan walks through, and within it's like within minutes, the queen has found him. It's almost like he's a madman for her because he's coming in, suing and all of his stuff. Um, and I, I find that to be a really strong and compelling metaphor life so when you are in that place of bitterness and anger and resentment you are going to more often than not you're going to like pull that others into that with you and something about lucy's willingness to see the good in others brings about a change in dumbness that transforms him not instantly he has to go through that evolution but it does evoke from him, it draws from him something better. Her um, lack of dial, her, um, her compassion for him draws out his better angels. 
Yeah. And, and I want to say it's a kind of um, faith that she has in him, you know, whereas what Edmund is drawn to from his anger and his emptiness and even his hunger, right? He's hungry, he's cold, um, and he reaches for magic. Um, he reaches for pleasure, you know, he reaches for this Turkish delight and this drink and this powerful, beautiful woman. You know, that's the interesting thing about the witch too is, you know, she's attractive. Um, she's not green or black, like, you know, witches in so many fairy tales, she's white, 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 which, you know, I don't think that Lewis was trying to talk about white supremacy in the late forties. Um, but I think still that whiteness as a color for evil is, is interesting. And just an Edmund's emptiness reaching for, again, this power and pleasure as a way to fill the emptiness instead of just the joy of a relationship and, you know, this faith in a person <laughs> or a fawn, excuse me. There's something about her whiteness that compares to white so that the evil is deceptive in its appearance and looks so much like Absolutely. what we're seeking. But right? it, is, it used to be the color of women. The literature of Queen Victoria wore a white wedding dress. Yeah. Nobody wore white to the wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The first one is the pale one. Yeah. Mm. Can we talk about the Turkish delight for a second? <laughs> <laughs> Chooses Turkish delight. Because <laughs> I, I thought a lot about this. If you want to hear my take, but go ahead, Casey. Uh, so I, I, I don't know. So I, I'm, I'm going to venture something which could be wildly off base. I don't know that in 1940s and 50s London or Britain that Turkish delight wasn't the most marvelously wonderful exotic dessert that anyone had ever. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Okay. Can I finish my thought? <laughs> uh, that it wasn't the most wonderfully exotic, luxurious thing you've ever had. In my head, it's good. It's it's good. It's not what I would. It's like um, Esau selling his birthright for a uh, um, for you know for some lentils. It's like would I sell my soul for some Turkish delight? Uh, it's like a chocolate chip cookie. I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's good. It's good. Hey, but in 1950, when this book was published, everything was racial. No sugar was one of the most racial things. So there's an extra sort of pitch for Lewis's first readers, and it's white. And uh, how many? Yeah. Uh, it's it's white. White. If, but, if I can try to make a point with this. Sorry. Which clearly is not working. <laughs> <laughs> but I find that um, isn't this something we do that we give so much over to something with which, if looked at honestly and truthfully, is really sort of like mine. But we give a ton of power and authority over our lives. I think about this a ton with social media, mm -hmm. um, like how much of ourselves we give over, we sort of sell ourselves for something that like ultimately after a few bites doesn't even taste all that good anymore and is sort of like, eh, but we have given ourselves over to it completely. I find this to be so wonderful, so wonderfully human in this moment that it is not the if, if Turkish delight is not the most wonderful, luxurious, exotic, tremendous, compelling thing, if it's just sort of okay, I find that to be even more truthful. Yeah. Except if you eat more of it, you will die. And so, so that's the other side. Yeah. I, I want to jump in because Mother <laughs> Heidi said she's given this a lot of thought, and I'd like to hear some of those thoughts too. Um, well, I, I agree with actually what, what Father Casey has said. I think um, it was a very, it was a rare thing, um, but why, you know, and sugar was rare, but why Turkish delight and not other sugar or candies? Um, and I think it's, it's exoticness and it's foreignness was a factor. And I, I guess I want to say like Middle Eastern things uh, had a sinister tinge. I mean, and they still do, right? I mean, people in turbans or, you know, scimitar swords. And I think something called Turkish delight 
had a had a smattering of evil sound to it so that maybe chocolates or ribbon candy would not have. Um, and I think too, if this witch can provide you with anything, you ask for you know the hardest the hardest to get the most exotic thing you can. And I also agree with you know it's powder it's sprinkled with powdered sugar which you know matches Narnia. Um, and I guess I also want to add the way Lewis writes about the Turkish delight is that it's more like an opiate than a candy in the end. It's this magical, he calls it bad magic food. Um, and I think just what Father Casey was saying about things that we all latch onto as our bad magic food um, that is not really wholesome or, um, or it doesn't really nourish what we're truly hungry for. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And also, along with the things that sometimes are famous traditions during Christmas time, like I would make bread at Christmas, but my family would eat it every week. I made it every week. But I made one batch. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have a. Because if you made it all year, they wouldn't, you would wear out. It's the law of diminishing returns, right? So it's like, if you had it all the time, I do think even fudge, <laughs> we see doubts that. <laughs> but I think there's nothing that, that doesn't have an eventual tipping point at which it's no longer enjoyable. We do have a comment from uh, Zoom land uh, from someone who was a child in England in the 1950s who said that Turkish delight was a Christmas treat, especially when they still had rationing. It was a very special thing. So. Yeah. Uh, in New Mexico, thank you, Jenny. <laughs> which start out the recipe begins with take two pounds of flour, then you go from there. But it's still something uh, that by the end of November, there are recipes everywhere in the Mexican newspapers about the best Christmas mm -hmm. So that was a great point. It was a great point to be able to die. I don't know about that. <laughs> Friends, we are drawing close to the top of the hour, and some of us have another service to head to. Some of you have a service to head to. Um, there's so much more we could say about these first five chapters. I'll, I'll notice uh, in, the, in the same keeping as pay attention to beginnings, pay attention to endings. So the fifth chapter ends with, with uh, the house, which seems to have come to life, chasing all four children into Narnia. And Peter holds the door closed, but he doesn't shut it. For he remembered, as every sensible person does, that you should never, never, never shut yourself into a wardrobe. There's something about um, encounter. What happens in the wardrobe is that they have, an, they have encounters with God. They encounter God. And we don't have encounters with God, do we, to shut ourselves in, but rather to reemerge changed transformed and to draw others into that experience as Lucy does. So um, maybe that's a good place for us to stop. And I will invite you to be drawn back into the wardrobe next week. We'll return and we'll, um, the reading assignment is chapter six through 10 of the Lion the Witch. So um, we'll, we'll be so glad to jump back into conversation. There's a lot left in one through five. Oh I'm my goodness, there's so much more. I can go on Mother Heidi, thank you so much for joining us today and for the gift of your Thank you guys. It was wonderful to be with you. Really fun. It's been a delight to get to know you, and I hope we'll stay in touch. Have yes, Rebecca, thank you. Thank you all, friends. Thank you.